the debt market is absolutely the most dangerous place right now. And it is one of the most central building blocks of your financial system, even if you do not realize it yourself. Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Uh, I'm speaking with Francis Hunt today, the market sniper, and it's Friday, uh, July 7th, 2023. We've just had non-farm payroll, and, and I've been following Francis on Twitter, and, and he's uh, made some very interesting comments, not just about the markets, but about things in general. Uh, Francis, uh, welcome to the channel, and thank you for coming on such short notice. No, great pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Manu. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, so I'm going to share here uh, a tweet you made, I think, earlier today. Uh, and you said, this is eight years old and never more relevant uh, for this year. Macro demand destroying event. Uh, that's number one. Two, likely bank failure on a scale unseen. And we've seen that already this year. And then keep out of the system cash and precious metals. So maybe you could elaborate on that tweet and then uh, talk a little bit about what you think is going on in the U.S. economy and uh, all the other uh, Western economies right now. Oh, absolutely. So in, first of all, in terms of uh, where we are, um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if you 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 probably picked this up. The uh, the bond markets are getting a little bit disorderly, um, and uh, the U.S. ten-year, the thirty-year, uh, are all reaching uh, for north of four percent uh, again uh, and moving on higher. In fact, that's more critical for where you based in terms of the U.K. Uh, in terms of the bond markets, because we're actually at the levels that uh, last time, when caught unprepared, the, the we had um, the pension freeze uh, crisis. In other words, the bond markets lacked the liquidity that pensions needed to liquidate bonds to actually make payments. So they weren't making payments to pensioners out of um, the... Uh, interest rates. They were actually making pensions out of redemptions of bonds, and there wasn't sufficient bid for them actually to get sufficient funds to make and meet pension requirements. So that was quite a freeze up. Uh, and you'll recall that uh, a prime minister and a chancellor got thrown under the bus after less than 30 days in charge. I think the moving truck had only finished unloading their gear and they were they were then out, um, of course, pension for life uh, on that 30 days, but never mind. It's a nice, nice job if you can get it. Um, but the, the whole principle of all of this is that debt markets are getting disorderly. So I want to just remind um, uh, people about a couple of core concepts. You borrow money into existence. So this is debt markets are actually the currency markets in reverse Every, every every bit of issuance of currency that is digital, um, which is most of it, has been borrowed into existence by a banking intermediary cartel that have a proxy license through a central bank um, that controls how much money uh, is created at any given time. Um, and what we're actually seeing over here, I've got brought up the United States 30-year. This is something we've been technically drawing on and saying, Never be in bonds, never be in bonds. This is not the era. And there are some people that are tempted, including, you know, people I truly respect. We interviewed Mark Farber, um, Dr. Doom and Gloom, and he said, you know, counterintuitively, it grabbed a little bit of bonds. And my overall simple, keep it simple, stupid uh, concept for most people is do not be in debt, just simply at all. Uh, and in fact, that the long term cycle is that all the, the debt that's been created, which is absolutely vast. And, and when you just we're talking about America here, for example, I think the last time I had a number, so this will be a bit old, and I'm sure it's got worse. But their receipts from tax cover 52% of their expenditure. That's probably barely half now, nowadays. That means everything they spend, they are adding new debt. 
at, uh, at, a, at a rapid rate. For every dollar they get in um, tax receipts, they are adding the same amount in debt just to meet their expenditure commitments for a single year. So that's a bit like, you, you, you know, you're on a 60,000 pound salary a year and you spend 120,000 and you're adding 60K to your credit card or personal loan every single year and rolling it. This now in an environment where interest rates are going up. And what we what we saw technically here is a technical break that occurred back here. It snuck out slowly. Most people weren't talking about it, but because we watched the bond markets, we circled it over here. And that was around about 15th of May. You then made our first interim, which is our technical uh, geometry. And then you had a, a pullback, uh, which was a falling wedge. And now you've had this reassertion, which we think ends at 4.29 as part and parcel of just this particular move on this particular structure. And that doesn't include the far larger structure that could uh, see you later, uh, in fact, run all the way to, let's get a number for you, quite a bit higher. Um, pull it down, pull it down, where it is, 4.76. So we are seeing continual staircasing of interest rates. So I want to just bring that in, uh, just explain a little bit around that. They need debt is being proliferated at such a rate. The only the reason we have persistent inflation and will continue to have is that it's policy. It's not. It's not by accident. They. This is a phony war of fighting inflation. In fact, when we pulled up the shadow stats, uh, which is also a tweet we put out, uh, which is something John Williams does. He, he confirms that uh, they are actually still easing. They are not tightening. People are living under a grandeur of there's tightening. There's tightening at a monetary policy level because interest rates have gone up. But this is what I call the, the you know, the, the fight the fire policy where you put out the fire with water on one side, but you need that fire because that inflationary fire is devaluing the debt. So you need to be seen to be putting out the fire on one end and you're pouring fuel on it on the other. So all you do is you're marching the fire along, but the same amount of uh, inflation is actually building. And in some senses, they're providing more fuel on the one end and they're putting water on the other end. So actually, they're keeping the fire. They're growing the fire of inflation. And why? Why would they pretend and do this whole deception? Uh, because I'm in. I'm in fact implying this massive deception here. Yeah? Um, why would they do this? Because they need debt to be devalued. And the way you devalue debt is through inflation. The only way you get out of uh, being over indebted is that you have to have inflation. That means everything in cost terms goes up. If you double the amount of uh, money in circulation over a period of time, you, everything ends up costing twice. Something's more, something's a little less that have economies of scale maybe, or for which you had surpluses for or were domestically uh, produced. But essentially by halvening your currency, if you double the amount in issuance, you're halvening your currency, which also means your existing debt value is halved. Uh, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to have this continual compounding of debt reduction so that they can extend what is an unsustainable system until they're ready to introduce their new system. But the problem you have is that banks can suddenly stop lending to each other. You can have all these freeze up. So they are still providing liquidity. That's fiscal. So you have monetary policy, which is interest rates, and fiscal policy, which is provision of capital for core industries, liquidity, etc. Um, and one of them, uh, so they are still keeping the banks fluid. Many people are wondering, well, why at these level of rates have we not had major failures? Because in actual fact, they are holding everything together with the fiscal loosening that they are continuing to do. And Shadow Stats highlights M1 and M2 numbers as being at record highs. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, uh, Francis, to interrupt yeah, you. But you retweeted something uh, about how the uh, US government is actually um, like subsidizing companies to keep people employed as well. Correct. I was going to go to that point. So thanks for bringing it in. What's actually interesting is the labor statistics are the validation or the justification for the monetary policy increases. 
we are not in recession. So the amazing thing is you, uh, in that end of empires, one of the key things is definitions get plagiarized, adapted, uh, all basis of comparison gets removed because of shifting definitions, change in statistics. We've done a lot of this with the consumer basket of goods, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a great way that you obfuscate uh, what you're doing. And the definition of a recession was recently entirely violated. It was and has always been for my entire fiscal and economic trading career, two quarters of negative growth. What's actually happened is, no, 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 it's not that now. We kind of, it's more vague in, and if you've got great employment, that doesn't count. You know, we, we they've not actually provided a hard, def, a new replacement hard definition because they want the vagaries. That's where they hide in the, in the, in the grayness of vagary. Um, but in actual fact, we have been in a recession and we continue to be in a recession. And this first quarter that ended was further on the adjusted shadow stats, another negative quarter. So not only are you in a recession, you're probably on an ongoing uh, recession already in an environment where they're actually fiscally still providing liquidity. Then you have the point that you brought up in that the labor stats are always so great and so hot. And uh, we just had Bidenomics uh, and first non-farm payroll that we've had today that he, he didn't overperform to. Um, he's had 14 in a row overperformances um, to expectations, which means those analysts that are generally bulge banks, primary dealers, uh, analysts, are almost setting him up to look good to validate and justify the current approach to inflation fighting. Interest rates high, but liquidity on the other side, on the sly, still being provided. Fight the fire at both ends, one with water, one with fuel. Um, and because we need the debt devaluation, which is in fact a currency devaluation, which is another reason why we've synchronized the whole world into the same state of debt deflation, because all the same caravan of merchant bankers have traveled through all the nations with their uh, typical strategy to ensure that no one currency is of the majors, at least. We are seeing uh, the, the likes of the Turkish lira lose uh, quite substantially. But uh, across the majors, it's, it's, it's quite a mixed bod. People can't tell what's happening because there's a similar policy going everywhere, unless, of course, you're Japan, which is an outlier uh, dog. So there are still some relative weaknesses, despite their attempt at synchronization and creating, you know, a leper colony of nation states. Um, but what you mentioned was the labor stats uh, are so hot that they can say it's not a recession by the original definition. A lot of that is based on um, manipulated numbers. There's the birth death nom uh, model that applies to non-farm payrolls. That's absolute distortion um, and can be manipulated on assumption very, very easily. There is the fact that other surveys of employment diverge from non-farm and have been flattened and going down while the non-farm number keeps adding jobs like America. I don't know where all these citizens are coming from that they're adding all these new jobs all the time. Um, so the definitions. You heard Simon Hunt on Palisades Radio referencing there's no um, descript there's no definition between temporary jobs uh, and gigs and actual jobs uh, as well. That's another hideout place. And then the tweet that uh, you're referring to, where actually there are corporate companies that wish to lay people off that have half jobs. They maybe have three production lines uh, and they only need two. They could technically meet all the current demand on two if they sweated those hard, but are kind of just leaving it and, and giving everyone an easy job on three production lines because government is contributing to the salaries of those that would lose their jobs if they were uh, set off. Jobs are the last thing you want cut because training people thing, training people up, getting them productive is a six-month cycle or rehiring people you fired. They tend to want better salaries because you could, they've been let go. They might want a sign-on bonus, et cetera, et cetera, if they already pre-trained. These, the, uh, these are aspects that the last thing that corporations want to do. So by the time people are thinking of cuts and the government saying, no, 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 don't cut them, just keep them, we'll help make contributions. That contribution has gone from 5 billion a month 
to nearly 30 billion. It's at 28 billion for the last month. So that trends like that. So you could reach the end of this year and you could, uh, you could potentially have 50 billion. I mean, where's the sky is the limit. The taxpayers aren't even aware that this is happening. This is, you know, on the low, low uh, items that are going on. So what you actually have is a fake number because people are being kept in work that shouldn't be under normal capitalistic requirements where you create an efficient environment that is making just sufficient product for the level of demand. Um, and that can be services, that can be manufacturing, it can be everything. So the, the, the whole narrative I'm calling deception on the, the labor na the narrative. The labor narrative means we're not in recession. A, you stand by your original definition. You don't change it because now you're technically in a recession. They never discussed doing it before when they weren't in recession. It's only once that uh, became clear. So they are putting more pain on the retail consumer in essence than is typical in the name of, you're not really feeling pain yet. We're not in a recession. All so that they can maintain inflation to devalue debt whilst also tightening interest rates, which crushes generally the consumer. It's actually good for banks uh, if rates go up a bit. Uh, it's for margins. It's bad for the consumer. It's bad for housing. So the, the real industries, commercial property, oh, my goodness, particularly in the states and the woke uh, towns and cities uh, of, of New York, San Francisco, they are, those are bloodbaths. Commercial property generally, um, you know, we could have a second pandemic. It seems there's lots of mumblings uh, of people engineering things. Um, you could have uh, people are working from home more generally, all of these things. So commercial property is probably a no-no. Bonds and debts are a large no-no. And the key game is everyone is put encouraged to call peak rates. So pa Powell actually gave them that opportunity by pausing and everyone's gone, that's the top, now we turn. No, it's not. Every pause is not the, is not a turn. Um, it's a bit like me driving to Munich from you know um, Berlin on the autobahn. Just because I take my foot off the accelerator in the fast lane for a spell doesn't mean I'm doing a U-turn and going back home. It just means uh, I'm slowing down in a particular journey and may re-engage the accelerator later. So uh, th that's where we're going. And the, this the, the Munich for bonds is great devaluation and a, and a super spike in interest rates, which will eventually become disorderly once everybody works it out. I'm trying to give everyone the, the message before. So no rallies should be taken on bond values. You're generally going to get continuation pattern setups. Um, if I switch the chart share to uh, TLT, for example, which is a popular ETF uh, on value of bonds, not on the rates, this yeah. is, and I'll remind everybody, we called this head and shoulder a long, long time ago. Um, and I it is- I remember that, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were getting in on this right shoulder and we called it even that it's going down on this inverted uh, HVF structure, these funnels over here. So we were real early on this. This one's now met target. And this is what it's done since then. Now, Target, I want to be clear on a head and shoulder, which is a secular end to a 40-year bull, doesn't mean you just make the head and shoulder target. That, that is just the natural geometry in that particular structure. What it means is you've had a major structural reversal of a 40-year bull market that now needs to unwind. So yes, you get a rally as you did here, but it wasn't terrible from there to there. You've tried three times to get above the 108 level, which is a bit like getting below the 4%. And you ended up down here, rising wedge and rollover. Because mm. you kind of had a bit of a stall box there between our target and the 108.50. And the level that has surrendered is to the downside on the valuation of a bond, which means more high yields. And I can see this low being taken out and this entire 40 year history being challenged with significantly low valuations, which is devastating for pensions, which means they need for these to let the air out of this bubble they've created. They need rates to keep going up because that is the corollary of the values going down. So we are going to see, but you'll probably have other things that fail well before, but assuming they weren't, they were, we were more robust, we would need to see worse than Falker level of rates. 
at, at peak Volcker. So um, for the bonds to properly, properly devalue like they need to. And things will get disorderly well before then. But until then, they've got to walk it in that direction until it starts slipping and it turns into an avalanche. So we are slowly tiptoeing towards the avalanche debt of debt uh, as, a, as a useful instrument. And that will be combined with a larger reset. You only have to look at the inversion, yield curve inversion I'm referring to, to see that we've had exceptional real yield curve inversions right now. I mean, I'll, uh, once again, I can grab the 10-year, which we haven't discussed, uh, and subtract the two-year from it, and you'll see that we are in absolute uncharted territory uh, in terms of the scale of the yield curve inversion. So this is all the precursor to a major financial reset, which you'll see the implementation of their new system. Um, and the things we've discussed with Clive Thompson, uh, one of your guests uh, yeah. as well, um, and how it all goes down and that detail all become very, very important. As we've illustrated before on this chart that we've shown, this is a chronic yield curve inversion. Oh, and yeah. naturally, the geometries typically, uh, I mean, the biggest before that were the subprime that was shallower and longer and the dot com. Those were huge, huge events. I mean, even the, the, the events of March 2020 inversion was not very much uh, by the yield curve inversion. And you know what happened there, the, the, the level that they had to go to to actually bring that yield curve half the way back up or two thirds of the way back up. What will you need to do as we get ever more sensitized uh, to bring this back up? I don't know, but I'm very afraid for when this reverses because the bigger the dip, the bigger the fall, the bigger the crisis. So money, and people got to understand that when you talk about bond markets, it often doesn't mean much to people in the streets. They don't buy bonds, they don't sell bonds, they don't think, they don't understand it. It's the money system that's been borrowed into existence. It's relationship with your currency. So the UK debt, let's pivot to something else because you've got a UK and US audience as well. Um, the UK debt is actually doing worse than even the American debt, and is now, as I mentioned, at that similar crisis level that you had when you had the uh, freeze up. Now, yeah. of course, they're more aware of that and they're better prepared, and they are pro probably providing liquidity for the pension funds this time that they weren't ready to do last time. I actually said I didn't like either the chancellor or the prime minister. They struck me as, as far too wet for anybody's liking, but they were thrown under the bus for the wrong reason. They should have been thrown under the bus for being uh, World Economic Forum leaders, but that's just about everybody now um, in this world. But they got thrown under, no, it was their budget that crashed the pension markets. In actual fact, the Bank of England had not been raising rates at the same speed as America had been doing. And as a result, we started to have a combination of currency crisis on the pound and debt market crisis. I'm gonna just pull this back to the weekly time frame, and, you'll, and I'm gonna compare it with the US Sorry. 10. Francis, could I just, uh, you were talking earlier, sorry to interrupt about the uh, obf obfuscation and end of empire of the statistics. And uh, I don't know if you've seen some of my videos, but I found out actually last year that the Office of National Statistics in the UK, uh, they changed the way they calculate CPI all the way back from 1949. And, and since May last year, we got a different number. And the reason I caught it is because I've always used the Bank of England inflation calculator, and it goes back to 1270 or uh, like almost a thousand years, which is quite amazing. But I noticed that uh, because the Bank of England has a CPI target of 2%. And uh, I noticed from a few years ago that I looked at when they gained independence in 1997 to 2020, the CPI average was 2.7. So they didn't manage to keep it below, below or at 2%. But if you go now to the same calculator and you look at the same period, it's dropped to one9 so like you said, yeah, they're obfuscating everything. And also like uh, the recession last year in the US, the first and second quarter, like you said, we had negative, gro ne negative growth. So we had the recession back then. Just wanted to add that 
No, very valuable points. And another part of the mercantile bankers' uh, ursary traveling caravan of tricks is the restatement of history at all levels, not just uh, statistical history, uh, but many, many things. It's one of their core uh, values. If you control the past, you control people's perception of the future and you can manage perception. It's all a mind game. There's a lot to be said about mind control. Just back to this chart and then I'll stop the sharing. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the relative underperformance of British debt. Um, this was the gold line is the US 10-year yield and the actual candlestick chart is the UK 10-year yield. And actually, British debt 10-year uh, yielded less and had a higher value than American debt until around about here, as you can see. And then we had this blow-off, which was the pension. They didn't even start on the same uh, exact same point, but the interest rates were different. You can see that you were paying less. This represents a positive difference on the American side, having to pay a higher yield. And since then, Actually, the yield requirement on UK debt is now always higher than that of American, largely. And if we look at this, uh, since this event over here, and if we look more clearly, this is a rounded bottom um, that's, that's occurred at the 4%. Think of it as a cup and handle lip level, if you will. You've got a massive cup uh, going way back here that's even out of sight. Um, but if I just draw it like that, and then it eventually works its way up. And now you've got this uh, handle all with the 4% level um, running through that. And this rounded bottom is pointing to exactly what I'm warning about. You have not seen the end of rate rises in the UK, the world and America. And you could in fact see uh, major spikes uh, at some point. And this is the nano thermite of your personal finances in terms of a controlled demolition. People that hold uh, or owe debt, even on contracts where they have fixed interest rates, they are likely, um, what do they call them, clauses, uh, acts of God clauses that could see them restate and renegotiate to they some re degree. Recall it, don't they, sometimes? Yeah, um, I'm trying to. There's a Latin phrase, actually. Um, yeah. You know, where... Clive Thompson, uh, he was telling me about his, I think it was his mother or grandmother. They had bought some consoles and it used to uh, uh, pay the coupon at 4%. They're perpetuals, I think. And then all of a sudden, the government changed the coupon to 2%. percent. <laughs> so they basically defaulted. So it's happened before. Exactly. Uh, and they will do this uh, to the pensioners that are investing in those instruments. So I would just say, uh, don't don't be party or parcel to uh, that. Um, the debt market is absolutely the most dangerous place right now. And it is one of the most central building blocks of your financial system, even if you do not realize it yourself. So the big story is debt markets, and that caused a bit of risk off for a while because we saw gold go off and Bitcoin had a skittish day or two the last few days because we started to make those high numbers. And uh, I mean, I showed you British just for fun. I can show you the Italian. I know uh, Mario's uh, mm. uh, got, got where it's got its uh, roots. Um, but the Italian tenure is also similarly in a structure. I'm going to take the American comparison off in this case. The Italian this is another tenure, pattern. I noticed recently, uh, it always used to be above the British tenure, but uh, now it's a bit below it. But, uh, oh, yeah, I used to trade BTP futures <laughs> uh, back in the 90s before they had the euro and it was a wild market. Yes, uh, am I showing my chart? Let me just share screen and show yeah. that Italian uh, quickly. There we go. Uh, so that everyone can see what you're talking about. Again, this is a structure that we see is going up. And that's currently at about 4, 4.3, 4.4. That's a target of 5.749. Uh, that's 5.75 from 4.3s and was actually 3.9 over here not very long ago. So we're on a weekly chart. The low here was around 3.89. And we are saying 5.75. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you because I've also been looking at a two-year uh, gilt yield because it's really important for the mortgages here. And um, 
it's broken out some key levels. And you know that triangle that you, you did for the treasuries, the yield, and also for the UK gilt tenure in the two years, even more pronounced. And you know the col consolidation patterns where you get a move up and then a flag. Usually you get, and we went from minus, from negative, the two year gilt yield to like 4.7 4 or 4.3 last year during the Quartang crisis and trust, then we consolidated. And now we've broken through the top of the, the triangle or pennant. And my target is for like 4.3 or 4.5% 4 from that break, which takes us to like 8% plus in the next 18 months. And, and I think people are not ready for that. Just like you said, we're going to like unimaginable uh, levels in terms of yields, and that's going to be uh, catastrophic. And maybe with that, you could talk about how uh, commodities and precious metals would react, because a lot of people think, oh, higher rates, uh, commodities are not going to do well, gold and silver are going to collapse. But I think it's different. It will be a little bit different this time uh, than is typical. Um, just just to before I answer on the gold and precious metals reaction to that, I want to just say the areas that are obvious, at once stating the obvious sometimes, just so that people are clear, escalation of interest rates will also lead to people that have shotgun finance on motor vehicles being thrown out. So there'll be a glut in cars, I expect. You could buy probably a year, two-year-old cars on people that have been thrown out of financing deals, particularly if they're not locked deals. Uh, and as I've already suggested, they may find uh, ways to um, to break clauses, uh, as I say, uh, acts of God type events where they can, in fact, invoke higher rates. Um, so you're not safe just because you've got a fixed. You're not you're only safe and you're, you're not entirely safe, but you're semi safe if you have exactly zero debt which I'm fortunate to be in the position of. But my overall, I'm going to live in a world where there is a lot of debt and a lot of companies with debt and a lot of people with debt. Uh, so I'm still not safe. It's going to affect my business in uh, various ways, my activities, my clients' abilities to do things. Um, so I'm trying to save as many people uh, from this. But property exposure, really, particularly in the UK, the values are ridiculous um the the debt goes down uh in value the rates go up uh the property prices will re-rate chronically you're going to have negative equity area you're going to have a lot of locked in people that won't be able to sell won't be able to leave uh so it's going to be really really dark you know when you're talking about the levels that you're talking about then there's the precious metals so i want to revert back to how we got to where we are from Falker all the way through to the March 2020 events, which was the final melt up in the bond market valuations and the, the ultimate low, I think 0.3% on the treasuries um, for rates, was um, a 40 year bull market in bonds where buy the damn dip was your game on bond valuations. You will not have 40 years to unwind this mess. So what that means is you're going to come down far harder, far faster, and there will be periods of utter disorder on the way down in essentially running these values to zero. So in a new financial system, no one's going to want to carry the flaws and the bugs uh, and the over indebtedness of the old. So these will be left to wither on the vine. We did a great video with uh, Clive um, and with your work uh, off the back of your work with Clive as well on our YouTube channel on how they will leave that to wither on the vine and die with the old system. Um, so in terms of currency, so there's no doubt that they're going to uh, just reset the clock as if there's no debt and start the system again. They don't want these uh, having to manage this large uh, problem and how that will come about. So you've got to work on the basis that these things could be worth effectively zero. They won't go straight to zero. There'll be a secondhand market only in that, but you can only get old dollars when there's new dollars and you can only buy certain things with old dollars. So then there'll be a black market rate between old dollars and new dollars and that'll continue to get worse and skid away. And then there's black markets. And next thing you know, you're getting very little for anything that was in the old system. Um, so that we, we discussed that at great length, but that's the, the 30 second uh, version of it. Um, so what, what we warning, what we're saying about this is that uh, it's a capital preservation error that will now matter. 
um, the search for yield is over. It doesn't matter what those bonds yields, eventually nobody's going to want them. If they're paying 30%, but it's a, a high likelihood that the capital is going to half in the next year because they'll be paying 60% and going full Argentina, um, why do you want to earn 30%? Why would you want to earn 12% or even 10%? Normally, that's a good rate of return. But if the valuations are in a disorderly decline and there's only one way and they're continuing to add to the debt at the phenomenal rate that they are, and you're stumbling into a reset where none of this last binge of the party. I refer to the, the narrative of the people that are running the economy as people that are had a bad time in a country and have decided to immigrate and are financially stressed. And they're maxing out all their credit cards to buy uh, furniture for their new existence in a new country uh, on credit that they don't intend to pay. Um, in essence, we are in that era. We are, everything is being borrowed. You need to look at the current politicians, the donations to Ukraine, the, the money laundering that's going on there, all the activities of nefarious nature that are going on there. This is the final fling. Uh, and these war, this war has to continue because it's the big money laundering. It's how the politicians build up cash, little brown envelopes, the military industrial complexes, kickbacks, all of that to give the insider priestly mercantilist classes all the wealth that they will turn into physical assets and carry into the new system. And all that debt that was associated with that is left on your shoulders and told because of your white privilege, because of your whatever, whatever, and imperialism, et cetera, et cetera. And now you're left holding that in your pension and you get tapered down to a nothing pension. Um, it's like the bank bailouts in Cyprus. People need to have this perspective. You're talking about a system that needs to die because it cannot continue. That which cannot continue will end. <laughs> you know, it's a simple logic statement, but to many people, we don't behave that way. It's interesting, Frank. sorry to interrupt yeah. you, because mm -hmm. I've been hearing a lot of people, like even people that I meet, friends and like acquaintances, they're saying, wow, it's, is it a good time to buy bonds because they're yielding five, 6%. And I keep telling them, warning them, you might want to just buy the one or the three month bills, but uh, never don't buy anything more than two years because uh, it's going a lot higher and the value of your principal is going to collapse. And I agree with you. Uh, I mean, look at uh, the Greek 10 year, it went to 40% during the uh, sovereign debt crisis in 2011. <laughs> uh, if you bought that, I guess you did get lucky because they bailed them out, but I don't think they're going to do it again. No, they can't. And I, I, my simpler answer, rather than saying, no, if you'd go the short term, but the people will buy the short term, they'll get away with it twice, three times, and then the fourth or fifth time they go bang. Um, it's like picking up pennies on the Autobahn fast lane. Um, you may pick up, there was a bunch of money spilt, uh, but it's all pennies. And the downside is you get absolutely clobbered by a Porsche Turbo doing 300 kilometers an hour. So my, my solution is we always take very low risk with highly expansive rewards. You're actually, if you're getting involved in the debt market, you're collecting pennies, moderate, very too low, and you, the risk is actually huge. And you're doing it at a time when systems need to change and an old system needs to die. If you were to have been that bond investor, you should have done it post Falker um, when he tamed inflation and everything was rained back. But anyway, uh, so I just say don't do it because people aren't traders. They're not on it. Most people aren't good enough. They don't. They get, they get away with something twice. It becomes self-enforcing. Uh, and I just say don't do it. Um, and it, it's much simpler. It's much more clear cut. Debt is going to die. Don't do it. All the risk, huge to zero virtue. Um, mm -hmm. But in, but anyway, we were we were talking that there, were, there was the manipulated labor stats. There's all of these elements. So they, they need inflation for this tapering this this bond. And what that's going to lead to is you might get small variations by country. And this is why we're such bears on the yen. Is that they're doing yield curve control there? Um, and they're holding it at 0.44 at the moment, in and around half a percent. It's clear the currency has to take the killing. So the Japanese yen has been a one-way short. What does that do for companies? We've just done our live trading day. We went through a bunch of um, equities in Japan. We think the Nikkei has a target of 57 with real geometry on an inverted head and shoulders. Not only is that whipping it past the 38,900 high, that was way over the 80s that... Uh, 
you know, Meryn Summers at Web, Web every year she started saying this is the year that it'll do. She's eventually going to be right. Um, you're going to do that new high and it's going to be tailwind of a devaluing currency that drives it and it, the bigger exporters that are actually earning other currency. But we didn't answer your question on gold fully. The preservation of capital era becomes a point where nobody trusts a yield anymore on account of the fact that that yield does not reimburse you for the capital loss. So the emphasis becomes instead of search for yield, there's going to be yield in abundance. But the asset that's holding it is collapsing. In fact, there was a crypto, I can't quite remember. There'll be someone shouting at the screen that was um, a called, I think it was called Time or something else. And it was paying thousands of percent, but the coin valuation was dropping. And actually, when you ran the math, most times, most people were losing money. Um, and you just, so you're going to have that same phenomenon. Do you want to be paid 30% on something that gives you back only a, a third of your capital? And that's bad mathematics. Um, you know, if you've got to be in it for a year and in a year's time, you get a third of your capital back, uh, but you paid 30% on your original ticket mount. Well, guess what? You lost a whole bunch of money um, and it, it, you're going to be in that kind of financial system. So the preservation of capital is going to be far more important. I want the, the whole digitalization and all this money is digital, even before CBDCs and everything. All this money is computers and it's assets and it's paper. It's not anything you can hold. So the, uh, and because a lot of property has this paper debt associated with it, its value will be affected down as well because everybody has utilized it. So if you hold an unencumbered by debt gold bar, you are holding something that absolutely will still be there in six months time and won't have lost two thirds. Uh, but that's paying you 25%. Uh, it's still going to be gold. It's still going to have those proper properties. So I see a stubbornly strong gold market, and we stand by our $2,900 next leg up for gold with associated $45 to $50 run um, for silver. So some people say, well, what's happening now? Though? Well, you broke out of a major uh, flag and you come back and revisited the roof and also, if you think of it at a horizontal level, I might just refer the charts again on that one, is you are three times touching a very seminal level. So I've given this explanation uh, to a few people um, on the gold because it's a, it, almost a boring time uh, for gold. But I want to highlight a few, a number of key points that many people need to be reminded of. So if we talk about gold, Typically, it knocks three times before it smashes its way through the door. And I'm going to uh, just take the eye off there. And I'm going to give, give you a th uh, three-month uh, uh, on this chart. Let's just see uh, if I can get the period where the $1,000 mark was run um, over here. And there's a classic example. And we were very bullish of gold over here. And many people were asking, well, when's it going to do this? I said, gold's going to permanently break this. Uh, 1,000 level, and it's never going to come back again. This will be the last time you will get gold with three digits. Uh, and we said that over here. But first, you had a big knockback. That was the events of 08, 09, where everyone panicked. Then you had a partial knockback, and then you had a very moderate one, three rejections. Then you got the bull move that took you literally to the next 1,000. That was 1927 high. So all of this was in and around the $900 mark. You got the breakout. When was that breakout? I'll come back to that in a second. But this was all the $1,000 ceiling, a key psychological level. You can see the $1,000 there. Uh, and it almost took you right the way up to the next $1,000, which is the $2,000, which is where we are now. But look at the move that you got from, uh, from that once you let it go. If I just rub out uh, that and highlight, we said... This is the day I even ran a trade to win thread. It said, this is the day gold broke out. And we highlighted the 2nd of September, 2009. This is the day gold broke out. That was a terrible time in the markets. 2009 was utter misery. Everyone wanted to be short. You had had the subprime crisis. Everything went down. Everybody's house went down. You know the things that you were talking about. Can what? How can gold perform in such a negative environment um, with high interest rates and property going down? That is subprime. Is it? 
This was the base of subprime. And during that period, you, you broke. That is 2nd September. And that took out our third high there, which is our trigger. So we get in earlier than everyone else. It then took out the all-time high, which was around 1,035, which had never held for long. And you were up, up, up and away. And you ended at 1927 uh, for that high. Yes, you had a long period of um, rounding bottom now, which is very cup-like which we will highlight for those as well. Um, here it goes, cup, 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 and there's your handle. And now the point I'm making about all of this uh, technical uh, discussion is, well, once, twice, and three times, and then you broke. Once, twice, three times and then you broke uh, and the key thing is we aren't pulling back as hard as you did here this is going to be a more moderate pullback uh, and it's going to wind up and then the next time you break this 2000 you're breaking it for good that is our overall um, assessment and that's typical how you test and by the way it's the round numbers 1000 2000 and ironically our technical target from these flags that we presented to you took you to 3,000, just under 3,000, 2,905. So you can see these technical levels are headline writers. So they won't want it to go straight through 3,000. They might make a technical run of 3,000 and want it to come back under uh, for a while, and then it'll gestate again for a bit. Uh, I don't think you'll have a lengthy period like this uh, where you'll gestate. Um, you won't have that same um, ability because now the game that is preservation capital will be far more apparent you have everyone has to first learn the new rules of the game because they're all still on the old rules search for yield search for yield so capital preservation it's a new concept and of course gold is going to be right at the forefront uh, and as gold is hitting 29 we see silver hitting 45 uh, to 50 range. And I want to show you something interesting about that, Mario, as someone who also has huge expectations for silver at some point. Uh, you need the patience of a monk, but eventually you do get rewarded. Um, silver is also has its own version of three times uh, a strike, but this is on an even bigger scale. And the bigger the scale, the bigger the subsequent move, which is why I say not only three digits, but potentially four digit silver can be on the way oh. in time. Not, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but in time. So if I just show you this chart, uh, I could have got away with three months. Let's do three months. This is uh, most of the modern era history of our lifetimes, Mario, for silver. And you'll note that the 4550 range is a key psychological era area in much the same way so if i just grab put an orange box there on the 45 50 range this is your 80s uh high that's your first touch look how long you bottomed out and how long that cup was 1980 all the way through to 2011 that was 31 years of round tripping before you managed to get back there and get rejected again the next target that we have that's uh, from here to here from the lows here are generating for us a 45, 46 range. At that point, we expect rejection again. Bad news, we expect rejection again, but I'm sure people will be a lot happier that silver gets to 45, 47. But then it's going to do the same, much like the gold chart is doing on the monthly. This is a three month, a quarterly chart now, because I have to cram in so much history to take you back to the 80s. And the break that then follows after a pullback here will be the one that takes you deep into threes. Uh, and at some point, if we go single digit uh, gold silver ratio, you're going to be looking at a four number, four digit number in our opinion. So that's a little bit of the, the technicals yeah. on gold and silver and my take. And capital preservation will now become the new mental framing. Interest rates will mean nothing. What's the risk on my initial investment? If you're only giving me small parts of it back, I don't care what rate you're doing because I'm losing money. And this is what people will learn. Once you get into a disorderly deflation of the debt market, they've created and built up so much over such an extended period across all countries. Who wants to own that asset? Well, the dumb money ends up in pensions. 
pension funds have always been the dumb money. The, the, the investments that don't work out end up in the pension pot. Why? Because you've got 40 years to hide your underperformance on uh, and for inflation to work up to fix the mess you've made. Um, the unit trusts that are bragging about their performance, the garbage goes into the pension fund. Um, the, the you know the big hits where Tesla went up and look at your you know twenty percent for the year. That's that's never a pension fund. Um, so at, that's a couple of warnings with regards to investment management and uh, the silver and gold charts. Great, and uh, just uh, one one quick question before we uh, wrap up. Uh, I'm just going to share something that I saw. I mean, you probably saw this a few days ago. The uh, Russian embassy, uh, I think, in, uh, I forgot, in Zambia or in a country in Africa, they they tweeted out that they're going to announce a new BRICS gold-backed currency. And now even RT is saying that they're going <laughs> to announce a, a trade currency that's backed by gold. What's your view on that? I personally think it's interesting and uh, it could affect the gold market, but uh, it's gold or the fundamentals for gold and silver are much bigger than just the BRICS trying to do that. Yeah, so um, I would love to believe we will get fully backed currency by gold, but the restriction that places on um, spending is something the mercantilist banker type classes are very clear of. Um, and who gets to vet how much gold there is? I do assess that China has way more than people assume it does. I would expect it to be in the 50 to 100,000 ton range, which is huge, um, just because they are importing. And, and that also includes citizens, by the way. So they encourage citizens, and they have actually a slightly cheaper price generally for gold over there as well. Uh, I've, I've put forward various theories. Why haven't China dumped? You know, a lot of people still see things in view of the nation state. Why hasn't China just dumped its one trillion, crashed the dollar, forced the Fed to buy that one trillion in um, debt uh, and just bought gold themselves for it? Because there's probably a deal being done behind your dirty doors. The fact that these countries are supposedly enemies doesn't mean there isn't an immense amount of cooperation on how by the transnationalist mercantilist previously classes that are actually going to move with the gold and the money and go go exist there so you know they brought the opium wars to undermine china that's why britain had hong kong they sent british citizens to go fight for it even though they had no gain in it um so you know this is how these guys work you mustn't have a national identity too strongly what they've done is we will coordinate when we pull this tent down everybody is involved in playing that um and in the meantime to compensate one country's national books for the fact that they're sitting with something that's largely going to go worthless um on the treasury debt um, we will allow them uh, a gold window price, a discount window to buy real money, which is gold. Uh, and that's why I think JP Morgan and the likes, you always see a selling, and I've mentioned this many times, and I think I've said it with you as well, that if you, if you split the gold chart that goes kind of like this since the 80s into three charts, the actual price, and then the New York session, it actually goes down, believe it or not, over decades, and the Asian session, it's an absolute moon shoot. So they are continually marking it up over the Asian session uh, and probably mask, uh, setting for delivery uh, to China in a way that you and I probably couldn't. If you and I formed a cartel and bought 100 million of gold and said, on those futures contracts, delivery, please, here's my address. I'm pretty sure they'll say, sorry, we're not doing delivery on that. We'll give you cash settlement. Um, but uh, they are doing delivery and the gold is moving east. Uh, and I think that's compensation for holding, not making the investment, uh, not dumping the treasury straight, straight away uh, and potentially even sitting and taking a bath on those treasuries. Uh, but they aren't adding to them, you'll note. They are actually slightly reducing them. Uh, so that tells you everything about the debt. The central bankers are buying gold and want a low price because they want to buy more and are dumping debt, American debt. So 
you know, the de-dollarization is happening through these kind of events. There is a lot of behind the curtain uh, events that are happening. There is no appetite for fresh U.S. debt in other nations. Yeah, I saw that uh, Janet Yellen went to China yesterday. I think she's there uh, Thursday, Friday, and tomorrow. So I'm sure there's a, a lot of stuff they're talking about that we won't know. They'll, they'll probably come out with some announcements that are for the public, for, for us, but they're not going to tell us everything. Absolutely. There's a duality to all. They'll say it was great and cooperative and lots of nice speak and handshakes and all of that. What gets discussed in terms of detail on various things you won't hear uh, in terms of a possible gold discount window, which is my theory. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. Um, the fact that they're not buying debt anymore and supporting the bond market, they might want them to re-enter as a buyer for a while. Or, you know, they might refuse and just say the Fed must eat it, monetize it all itself. So the Fed is the biggest holder of American debt, which is actually a, a, a cooperative of American banks. So the mercantilist bankers are holding the toxic bank in terms of the debt. Uh, so they will go down, um, but they will just walk from those entities and walk onto the other half of the planet. Um, and be part and parcel. So, you know, yeah. don't feel they'll sorry have, for them. Uh, they'll have the hard assets as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They'll have plenty in hard assets. Yeah. And that's, you do what they do, not what they say. Uh, yeah. Hard assets, capital preservation is the game. When monetary systems are at their peak perversion and due to end, capital preservation is the only game. It's not the game, it's the only game. It's the only thing you should be focusing on. Debt will go down. You need to own that property. I also think they've got a plan for people like me. Uh, they might want you to register your gold, register your property, put it in, tokenize it, NFTize it. They can print up some tokens and buy it off you. They can have forced, oh, you underdeclared your house uh, as per this rule law. This has already been floated by Vitalik Buterin and, and uh, a Chicago professor of, I would call the mercantilist classes, um, that anybody who is considered to undervalue his property, some other party is entitled to make a purchase of that property at the price that you valued it. So they'll up property taxes. They'll then put you in a choice by either paying extortionate property taxes, or if you undervalue your property, they'll turn you into a tenant in your own home. This on tokens that they'll control the issuance of. So they literally can computer up tokens and buy up everybody's homes. And I do feel that is the game. So NFTs and tokenizations of all your assets are not a good thing because they'll turn you into rentiers on your own property through virtue of them conjuring up as ever many tokens they need and saying, why do you own this stuff? Let us own it for you. You can just rent it. You can get the new model in a year's time, kind of like pushing you into HP for cars, all the stuff. You don't have to worry so much about it. We can do the maintenance. We'll come around once a year and collect it, do the basic things, make sure you, you don't need this hassle. Let's make it safe and easy for you. Sure, it can stay by your house, but you pay us this rental. This is the whole way of all the equity companies. You used to be able to buy Microsoft Word. Now you rent it. You used to be able to purchase uh, you know, a lot of software, now you rent it. Uh, everything is moving towards a rentier and yield society, and they will sell you decentralized blockchain <laughs> as a reason for you to believe that it is safe and it's not totally controlled. Decentralized into a cloud that only sits on an Amazon or an AWS server uh, for which they can re-centralize with AI and, uh, and all the computing power that's ever been unleashed. Uh, on in the world and for which uh, the key thing when they were talking Bitcoin and they had Larry um, think on well Black Rock the key thing is he he was talking about the technology you need to listen to his phraseology and this is an important point about how they will get all your assets into the cloud on tokens and NFTs and this is the introduction of derivatives so what does a derivative mean a derivative means instead of trading the actual assets you trade a proxy, which is something that holds the power over the ownership on that asset. 
So what they want to do is these physical properties that exist, they want to be able to own everything without even having to go there. They can look at drone footage or Google Maps and just take this thing off you and they can purchase it, the token on it and then send somebody a year later or whatever to do whatever they want. So think said on Bitcoin, instead of saying, yeah, yeah, Bitcoin's awesome, or Bitcoin's great, he said blockchain and decentralized networks are great where we can identify the beneficial owners of all assets that can be tokenized nfts and tokenization and the blockchain that is decentralized he was quick to add it seems uh, like so the horse. game is going to be they're going to be putting us all into blockchain registering on assets and there will be a forfeiture of some sort if you do not that will then become a black asset which if you choose to sell, people will say, oh, I'm not licensed. I don't have this. You don't have the token. I won't be able to sell it. You'll have to sell it to other black pirates like me who would be quite happy not to be in the blockchain. And then what will happen is they go, oh, gold owner. Well, you seem to have done reasonably well. Here's your capital gains for owning gold. Oh, shame. It seems you're going to have to sell a third of it to meet that tax. Never mind. You can do it on NFTs and tokens. We'll happily buy it. And that's we'll, you'll seed ownership in your vault, wherever it is in the world. Um, that will now be registered in our name and controlled. All done online. Aren't we awesome? We made it so safe and easy for you. Uh, and we've, of course, you know, bought your house. Uh, because you underdeclared your for tax purposes, so now you owe us a rental, um, and this is the how it works going forward. So this is their modus operandi. He was super interested in the network and the identification of all beneficial owners and tokenization of all assets. Hmm. He wasn't saying, "Yeah, Bitcoin to the moon." He, he was. This decentralized ledger, that's the big thing. And of course, the decentralization is the absolute lie. Uh, it's the lie of all lies. It's the biggest lie they're telling you. Yeah, it's fragmented pieces of information that's quickly reassembled on the back end <laughs> as only standing on two servers with AI and a big bot. And they'll go, oh, Francis, we have the following. You have four motorcycles, two houses, uh, and, a, and a, a partial ownership in a place in Turkey, and da 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 Da, 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 and they'll have it all because you will have to be KYC along biometrically with your face with that token. And this is the great danger that everybody needs to understand is coming. You've got to survive the debt game that they're going to pull on you. You've got to get into physical assets, but you've also got to go to places where it's going to take a lot longer for this tech to get in. And the middle classy places of the West with good systems and tax and IRS are not the places. They're the first that are going to have your property on <laughs> that the, with through the solicitor. Oh, we're required to do this by law now. Da, da 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 We've registered it. Here's your token NFT. You need to keep that safe. Here's your secret phrase. Um, da, 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 all of that comes. And they won't do everything immediately. They'll slowly introduce these rules. They'll start upping the taxes on um, properties, upping the taxes on ownership of precious metals. Uh, and that's why I say you're going to have to have gray or dark assets. Otherwise, you're going to be, everything will be known in the grid. Uh, and boy, are you going to pay. So, uh, Francis, maybe you could tell the viewers, well, <laughs> because you just spoke about uh, protecting your assets and that it's not going to be easy in the West. Uh, so before we finish, you can tell them about the service that you, you provide in relationship to that and maybe tell the viewers where they can find you online as well for your, uh, for your content and your work. Thank you, Mario. Yes. So first of all, You've got to build your wealth. Many people still have plenty of work to do in building your wealth. There will be real opportunities. This is just an obstacle course. Don't get mauled out by this and too black-pilled about it. This is a great opportunity for you to advance your life immensely, but there are many pitfalls. So you need to further build wealth because you might have some, some tax to pay on those assets that you invested so well in. Um, you need to protect your wealth which requires structures and legal entities that they, let's leave it as they for now, 
themselves are utilizing how to implement. So we do and have services for all those things that involve a structure that involves how to buy a property. You also need to consider owning things outside your current country, potentially if you're in the West moving. I'm sorry if that sounds inconvenient. That doesn't mean you have to. You can still go and do other things that are outside your country uh, if you can't move. The, any action is better than none. And this will give you diversity of options, multiple citizenships, uh, or rights to, uh, to residency are going to prove very useful. We have services and people we refer to through that that do exactly what we do, that can open crypto accounts, that can do various things. So on the reset side and structuring side, those are services we offer. Um, they can visit our website to book a call uh, and also email on support at the market sniper for the reset stuff. The build well side is HVF method on the traditional markets and crypto. They can watch the YouTube, the market sniper or the crypto sniper. And if they like, there's a link to the website again to book a call. We like to speak to everybody first. We don't hide. We've been here for a long, long time since 2009. We, we reduce expectations. We want sound money management, uh, but uh, we want you to stay in the game. So staying in the game alone is winning, Mario. Uh, and too many people are, got, are gonna tread on landmines uh, through this period. It is gonna be very heavily mined, but the reward is huge for those that navigate the, the minefield. And I don't wanna be excessively black pill. If you survive a tough ob obstacle course, your relative wealth to those around you goes up phenomenally and capital preservation is the theme. So the YouTube channels and Twitter, as you mentioned, the market sniper and the crypto sniper for the Twitter and the YouTube channels. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you're welcome and thanks for coming on Francis and have a great weekend. Same to you.